Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jo Leslie, and it's my great pleasure this afternoon to be talking to Simon Weston, OBE. Now, Simon, of course, is well known for his, the recovery that he made after the Falklands War and the charity work that he's done since then. But what is perhaps less known is his business and his financial skills. Uh, Simon has written and published numerous books, including, of course, his own autobiography and a series of children's books. And in 2012, he established his own security company, which offers everything from sniffer dogs to covert surveillance. And he's obviously a popular speaker on the business circuit as well, demonstrating what a positive mental attitude can achieve with, and how that can influence great business goals. Now, Simon's here at the Master Investor today talking in the context of his role as a director of Zappawu, which is a startup company which is aiming to do for disabled travelers what lastminute.com has done for the mainstream traveler. We'll find out more about that in a minute, but let, first of all, Simon, let's start with asking you a little bit about your journey here today. Now, you were just 20 when you went to the Falklands, and, or, and you had your horrific injuries, um, but since then, you've managed to turn what happened to tremendous advantage, and your own career clearly demonstrates how a positive mental attitude can achieve great business goals. Do you think it's the same when it comes to investment? I think determination and perseverance is one thing, but you have to have a strong confidence in whatever you're doing and the, the right sort of infrastructure in place to allow you to be able to move forward and the right type of people involved. Um, so if you're going to invest, then you have to have trust, you have to have belief that things will, will happen, but that's a gamble. But then again, so is life. And for me, being able to put my life back on track was a major gamble because I had no idea what I could do. I didn't realize that I had the capabilities and the strengths and the intelligence that I had. You know, I was a prop forward, I was an infantry soldier, I was used to solving most of my problems with brawn rather than brain. Um, but all of a sudden, when all that disappears, you end up having to do something that's going to, to deliver you a future. And that's what I've had to discover. And uh, I've been able to do that. But it's been a long journey, but it's been an eventful and exciting one, and I've learned an awful lot. So it took years of constructive sur surgery, I understand, including 70 operations, was it? Uh, it's around about 95 now. But 95 operations, wow. I haven't been counting, by the way. Yeah, to get, and it, that was to get you to a point where you could once again, I guess, physically enjoy life. Um, do your physical disabilities still present any challenge to you? Yeah, I suppose they do, but it's, it's minor, really. They're just frustrations, they're irritations. I'm sure there are plenty of people who've got different disabilities or issues in their lives that they just get on with, and you just get on with it. But it, it presents problems, but mostly to do with weather and, and being able to use tools and stuff like that, because my hands just won't bear it with skin grafts. But you have to be very conscious of the weather all the time, the cold. Um, skin grafts and scars can split. And uh, with the sun, you know, it's... You really have to take care of it tremendously well. So you have to be very careful, but as a whole, I mean, I'm, I'm able to manage my disabilities very, very well. But, you know, it's what ended my career, it ended my sport, and ended one or two other things as well. So has it affected your ability to travel at all? Uh, no, not really. Uh, it did in the early days. My ability to travel was very much tempered by who was with me and who could help me carry things, because obviously carrying bags with the state of my hands at the time and freshly created skin grafts. Um, the skin grafts were very fragile and would tear, so I needed people to support me and help me to do things. But that's all changed over the years as, as skin grafts and, and that toughen up and you're able to manage your life far better. Um, I've been able to, to go anywhere I want to really and do anything I want to do, but it took a while. It did take a while. So your new business venture, Zappawu, um, is all about enabling people with physical disabilities to have greater choice when it comes to booking travel and leisure. But is there really a big market for that? Well, there's a huge market. I mean, you, you've got all the other big players in the marketplace that offer different advice and different opportunities for travel. But what people don't realize is the disability market is very much hampered by the lack of, uh, of a genuine portal that allows people the opportunities to go places. 
There isn't the information available. There isn't the fair deal that's supposed to be out there. There is accommodation, of course there is, and it would be foolish to say there isn't. But that accommodation is not always available at the same price that maybe able-bodied people would be able to access it. The same fair play doesn't exist. But also, um, you can't guarantee that those rooms will be available because sometimes in some places we've actually come across that those rooms have been used as storerooms or the rooms because they were offered up maybe two or three days before to able-bodied people, so those rooms no longer become available. But I've met lots of disabled people who've tried to go on just short breaks, and those haven't been made available because people can't find out the right information about how to get from A to B. We're not knocking anybody. We're not saying anybody's doing it wrong. We're just saying that there's a gap in the marketplace for something like this to exist, to support whatever is out there, but also to help correct things and rectify some of the, ine uh, the inequities that are out there so that people do get a fair shake of the whip. But nobody in the disability market is asking for any greater favour or any greater handout. What they're asking for is just fairness, just to be treated fairly, that's all, and to be able to, to access the right type of, of relaxation, holiday that, that they require. Everybody's entitled to that, to have their couple of weeks away and to share it with their loved ones. But if it's being denied to you because there aren't the right type of uh, organisations or information out there to allow you to be, to be able to do that, then we just think that's just unfair. So we're trying to redress this. And is the, do you think there is the product out there, the, the accessible product out there for, for people? To... Uh, not in the way that we are trying to create with Zappa Wu. We're trying to create that opportunity where people can make one phone call and we can help them arrange from door-to-door -door service, so leaving home to arriving back at home, so that the, the sting is taken out of the tail. Because for people to go abroad, you've got to rely on whatever may be available on the other end. But if you can guarantee that that transport is going to be suitable for your needs, if you can rely on the transport in this country from door to airport, that when you get to the airport, that your, your needs are going to be met. So that it takes all that sting. But it's not just here, because here we get the idea. We get what it's about. But when you go abroad, you can't always guarantee that. So it's making sure that that's available so that people do get the best experience. And all of that worry about going from A to B is taken away from you. And that the accommodation that we are in links with will be suitable for your needs and purposes. And really, those are the biggest worries that people have. Many able-bodied people go on holidays and have disasters. But just think how much more compounded that is if you're disabled, if you have somebody that has real problems of mobility. Can you imagine how much worse that would be compounded? To find somewhere else in a short space of time would be near impossible because for able-bodied people, it becomes a real problem. So what we want to do is to take the sting out of that, to allow people to access a proper experience and to actually go and get what they pay for. You know, because this is a business, not a charity. It is a business opportunity. That's why we're here at the Investor Show. It's to give people an opportunity to help other people as well. But we want to make that experience the best one they possibly can get. That's what it's about. So, of course, the, um, the travel sector, the tourism sector, has actually held up pretty well during the financial crisis because it's the one thing that people haven't stopped doing is taking holidays. Um, so it, it would seem that it is quite a good sector to start a business in, but what do you see as the risks, or do you think there are risks if people are considering investing? Well, there are always risks um, with anything, whether people buy into the whole situation where the people buy into it. But what you've got to realise is there are 12 million disabled people in this country. And for every one disabled person that goes on holiday, you're pretty much certain they're going with somebody else. They're not going on their own. So that's a guarantee of two people travelling. And whatever the, the risks are, I think, you know, they're experienced in every market you go into. Um, but the tourism market is growing. It's not diminishing. Um, what we see is that 12 million in this country, and you roll it out across Europe, you're talking in excess of that 12 million, well in excess. But if you think about the spend in this country of people who went on holiday last year was around about 12 and a half to 13 billion pounds. And then we know that there's about eight to 10 billion that's unspent on holidays in this country. But if you roll that out across Europe, you're talking in excess of 120 billion pounds of potential spend for the disability market to provide a suitable service. And our, in our experience and our knowledge, 
tells us there isn't a suitable format out there. There isn't a suitable portal to give people that favoured experience. And we don't think that it's right that families should separate so that one group in the family can go on holiday and leave behind a loved one. We think that's not a suitable scenario either. We think that the whole situation should be redressed. It should be looked at. And we, we, that's what we're here for. That's what we're trying to achieve. Um, and we will achieve it. We will achieve it, but we do need people to come and get involved. But surely in the spirit of inclusivity, what you should really be doing is encouraging your last minute dot do coms or late rooms or whoever to have more accessible product on their sites rather than having to always making disabled people have to go to a special dedicated site. Oh, that's ideal, but they've had their opportunity to do that. They've had more than a fair opportunity to do that. You know, nothing that we're talking about at the moment about disability is new to anybody. You know, so if the, if the already established sites haven't done it, then why haven't they done it? And what do they see as the pitfalls? And so far, none of them have actually given us a major reason why they haven't done it. It's just they haven't done it. And we are doing something that the others just haven't. Um, maybe we're just hitting the niche market. It's a simple idea, but then again, how many people have turned around and said, God, I wish I'd thought of that. Such a simple idea, such a straightforward idea. And some of the best ideas are just very straightforward, just very simple. You know, it's going to take a lot of work to create a suitable service to make sure that the service is adequate for the people who want to use it. But at the end of the day, you know, don't, don't disregard it because other, the bigger players haven't done it. Just because they haven't done it doesn't mean to say that they actually thought about it or even had a desire to take part. Are you worried about being seen to pers you personally being seen to try and make money out of disability? Well, it's a business. Um, disabled people want to spend their money and it's up to them how they spend it. And we're not preying on anybody. We're actually giving people an opportunity to access a service that they can pay for. Um, you know, they've got that disposable income. They have a huge amount of money that they want to spend. Well, let them spend it any which way they want. And when you look at, it's not just about disabled people, you know, that you perceive as disabled in wheelchairs or with walking frames, people with motor neurons or anything like that. You know, we're talking about some of the people who are over 65, over 75 years of age who have ambulatory problems. They're, you know, they're known as wobbly walkers to me. You know, when people can't get around as easily as they once did, they also can be classed as disabled. They can also look at wanting to have a holiday where they can access things, where we're giving them knowledge about how many steps they may be accessing. You may have a disabled room, but you may not have easy access to that disabled room. And that becomes a problem. So, you know, there's a lot of people, and we are growing as a market for many, many more people who are past a certain age that do have difficulty moving around, that do have difficulties getting from A to B. So what we want to do is to be able to offer people a, a desired experience, whatever their age. So don't just think of the stereotypical disabled market. Um, people do become disabled just through age. Where does the name Zapperu come from? Um, it was a chosen name by, by the creator of all of this, um, Bob Raymond, and he just liked the name. He thought it was kitsch, he thought it was funny, he thought it was a memorable name, and that's exactly where it comes from. Nothing more, nothing less. Right. Um, and I, mean, I think it's not just about the, what they call the purple pound, which is a, a new, um, I know it's a new, a new phrase that you've learnt, isn't it? Yeah. The, the disabled pound. But um, you're also seeing that the grey market is something that um, this product or this platform could appeal to. Well, the silver traveller is definitely a, a market, you know, for for investment as well, because you know, we, we learned only just last week that people over 65, the pensioners who are all retired and whatever, they spend on holiday on average about three and a half thousand pounds a year per person. That's a huge spend. Mm -hmm. That's a huge spend in people wanting to have access to a holiday. But if they have disabilities, if they have ambulatory problems, if they have special needs, then isn't it right that we give them the opportunity to spend it in an environment where they are going to be given a much more um, a much, a much greater certainty of satisfaction in their holiday experience. Right.
Okay. Uh, what time scales are you working to? How soon is the product, is, is the platform av available now, or what, what's the time rollout? Well, we are, we are on different crowdfunding websites, but we are looking to um, launch this in November. Uh, if we hit our achievable target by then, we will, we will launch in November, hopefully, and um, then it's, it's up for everybody to access it. But we've got a lot of the companies, a lot of the major companies are signing up to it now to sign up to the, the agreement and the, the ethos of it all. So we're getting people to agree. So we, we've started, we've done a lot of work. This has not been in a five minute development stage. This has been going on for uh, over two years. So we're, we're coming to the end of the development stage now and we're getting ready to deliver. And you're looking to raise some money today, I understand. We're looking for a, a collective of around 300, £350,000. So um, and that can be any amount of people making uh, a certain amount of money. I think it's roughly a, about a thousand pound minimum investment. But uh, we're looking for 350,000 pounds, and then hopefully we'll have more than enough there to, to launch the whole site. Uh, we'll be able to employ enough people to make it all happen, and people will have then hopefully the best experience they possibly could have on a holiday. Probably better service than able bodied people get in some circumstances. So, um, do you, are you somebody who makes investments yourself? Not I, necessarily in this company, but am I what? Do you are you in, are you an investor yourself? Not in Zappa Wu, but generally. I am do an you investor. Invest? I am an investor. I do invest money, um, and it's a gamble. It's a risk, you know. And uh, I have lost money in the markets before, um, but I can still smile about it. That's only because I'd rather smile than cry. But um, you know, I have lost money before, and it's not a pleasant feeling. So. Um, I don't intend to lose money on this one. I uh, intend to see this one work. Uh, and, and yeah, and uh, hopefully everybody will, will win. And it's a win-win situation. You know, if people are having what they pay for and people are making money out of that, well, why not? As long as it's done in a fair and equitable way, then happy days. So what's the best investment that you've ever made? The best investment I ever made? Um, probably the best investment I ever made was my wife's smile. Yeah, paying for that is more important than anything else. Being able to fund her. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I've invested in one or two things, but I, I, do it all with, uh, I do it all with a friend of mine who's a lot more knowledgeable about investments and shares and things like that than I am. You know, I wouldn't want anybody to think that I'm cleverer than I actually am. I'm just an ordinary guy who's given it his best punt. So I guess like many people who are sort of well-known, you get approached all the time um, by charities or by companies or what have you to um, back their cause or to, to get in. How do you make that decision as to what's worth your time, worth your money? Um, uh, when it comes to backing charities, I, I just have to believe in what they're about. I just have to realize who they are and what they're doing. Um, and if I like what they're doing, uh, then I will go for it, but I obviously have a, I have a desire to see things working better for military charities because of my history, but there are lots of other things that I care about um, and care about people. People are very important to me. Um, people have their other choices and desires, but that's mine. I care about people very much, and uh, I just happen to be in the disabled environment, but I would always be supportive of something like this where it's about giving people a better experience, a better choice and a, and a happier environment to go and spend their money and do whatever they want to do, you know. That's what I do when I go on holiday. I have the greatest time I possibly can and hopefully my family do also and I think everybody has the right to that. So you were just 16, I think, when you first went into the army mm. um, and 20 when um, you were in the Falklands War. Did you ever think at that stage that you would be having a career in the sort of in the business world? Oh, good gracious, no. Um, you're right. I joined the army at 16, left school when I was 15, worked as a metal fabricator on a dead man's name at the age of 15 in, in Abathor Cement Works. Um, and then I joined the army at 16 and had a fantastic career, enjoyed myself immensely many laughs, many stories, um, and I regret not a moment of it. You know, I'm not happy about being blown up, but it started a whole new life for me, a whole new career, and I had no, no idea that I'd get involved in investments. I'd be sitting in the investor show talking to 
a lot less people than Nigel Farage, but then again, I'm not as controversial. Um, <laughs> and probably don't think I've got enough to say about the world as he does, but there we are. That's the way it goes. But yeah, I never thought I'd be sitting here doing this, and um, no, I'm thrilled. I mean, it's the way life takes you, but it's all about how much you invest in yourself, really, as to whether you're going to be capable or able to do these sorts of things and be around this type of audience and environment. Um, yeah, but I, uh, I'm quite happy with the way things have worked out up to now, and um, hopefully, with a bit more luck, we'll have a lot more of you people join us and we'll go from success to success together. So finally, what is the single most important thing that you've learnt from all your experiences to date that could help somebody who manages any type of investment portfolio? Oh, accept it when you lose. Accept it because no matter how much you try, if you're going to lose, you're going to lose. Investment is a gamble. You know, sometimes you've got to lose to enjoy winning. And when you enjoy winning, well, that's just a thrill. That's exciting. But, you know, for every loss, there's always, there's always a failure. And there's no real failure except for not making the attempt in the first place. Because you learn something from every failure. Like, I lost money in the stock market in the 90s, and I've not lost any since. You know, I didn't lose too much during the crash. You know, I was very lucky. But, you know, these things happen, but you know, you have to accept that things stood still. Things stood still, they marked time, they didn't march on as well as they had been, but I didn't lose, so I can be happy with that. But you know, you've got to be prepared if you're going to invest to, to not have it be as successful as you would like straight away. Thank you. Um, Simon, I think, is going to be um, around a little bit on the Zappawoo stand, which is on number, uh, stand number eight on the ground floor. Um, so I think um, what we'll do now is we'll cut this session short, a little bit short, which will, I think we'll give, I know you've got to rush off quite soon. So unfortunately, this um, environment doesn't allow um, you to ask some questions, but I'm sure you've probably got questions that you would like to ask Simon yourself. So if we cut the, the session short now, then that it gives any of you chance. I'm sure, Simon, you'll be happy to answer questions or talk to people individually. Um, but for now, can I just, on behalf of all of you, thank Simon very much for sharing your journey with us today. Thank you. Thank you.